The cool night air greets me as I step out of my car and gaze up at the foreboding structure, this former mental asylum that's in the process of being gutted and renovated into a boutique hotel. Pushing open the heavy door, I let it swing closed behind me with a loud creak as I find myself in the dimly lit and deserted entrance hall. Renovations look to be well underway, and it's always an odd thing to see the juxtaposition of the modern hotel finishes and the decaying features of the former asylum. Heya, you're the night man, yeah? came a gruff voice from the makeshift office that had been set up in the corner of the hall. It was the large man, Ted, that had interviewed me. That's me, Simon, I answered, reaching out to shake his hand. Follow me, I'll give you the tour. Ted wasted no time in leading me through the labyrinthian halls of the former asylum, his heavy boots thumping on the wooden floors as he gestured to the security monitors, emergency exits, and the sections of the building that were still in need of significant restoration. It's a simple gig, Simon, he explained matter-of-factly. Make your rounds, ensure there are no interlopers wandering in, and keep an eye on all the construction gear. If you spot anything out of place, let me know. We get back to the control room, and Ted starts showing me the surveillance equipment, all of it looking far more modern than anything else in the building. He motions towards the bank of monitors. These are all over the building. Make sure you watch them. After giving me a quick tutorial on the controls, he walks me around the building again, showing me the extinguishers and exits, and warning me about the spots where the lights flicker and the steps creak too much. It's an old building, been around a long time. She's got some settling, he explains. When we get back to the office, my eyes fall on a yellowed sheet of paper taped to the desk, its edges dog-eared, and the handwritten text faded and smudged in places. It's a list of rules. I pick the paper up, scanning the strange rules. Rule number one, don't turn off the security monitors, I said aloud, half laughing. Isn't that covered in security 101? Ted just grunted. Keep reading. My smile faded as I lowered my eyes back to the page brow creasing as I scan the remainder. Don't go into room 237, even if you hear someone crying, I read, my earlier amusement now replaced by confusion. If you spot a woman in a white gown on the cameras, avert your eyes immediately. What is this crap, Ted? Are you screwing with me? Ted just shakes his head. Just read them, Simon, and keep them in mind. Something about his tone makes me shift uneasily. It's the first time he said anything that makes me feel uncomfortable. I mean, the way he's been so casual and almost flippant about my responsibilities and my safety up to this point has been reassuring. But now, for the first time, I'm starting to feel a bit nervous about being here. I look over the list again and frown. Are you sure this place isn't haunted? Ted laughs and gives my shoulder a light slap. Just do your job and you'll be fine, Simon. I'll see you in the morning. And just like that, I'm alone in this big, empty building. I look over the list again before dropping it back on the desk. It's a job, I tell myself. Nothing more. I sit back in the office chair and look over the monitors as I get settled in for the night. I listen to Ted's retreating footfalls, shaking my head. A chill ran through me, and I realized I was still standing there, alone, in the security room, surrounded by banks of monitors and the faded wallpaper on the walls. I shook it off and dropped into the chair, adjusting the monitors a bit. As the minutes wore on, I decided to begin my rounds. The monitors hummed softly as I stepped out from the security office and into the hall. The corridors of the asylum all looked the same. Aged gray and tan walls, covered with wallpaper, iron grates, and fixtures worn from decades of exposure and neglect. Even though there are construction crews all over this place during the day working on renovating the interior and making it ready for the incoming tenants, there still seems to be a profound sense of silence in the place, especially at night. It's as if the walls themselves are holding their breath, keeping their dark secrets from the light. The atmosphere is oppressive, and I can't help but to wonder at the countless tormented souls that once spent their final days within these walls. The shadows are too deep, the echoes too long. I shake it off and keep moving. Rounding a corner, I spot the entrance to room 237 ahead. I noted the heavy wooden door earlier, looking far more aged than the others, which must have been replaced more recently as part of the renovations. Something about the door feels out of place, and I recall the odd warning from the marshal earlier about not entering it. I shake my head at the oddity of it and continue my approach. My steps slow as I near it, and my eyes wander to the faded numbers affixed to the door. 
The scent of must and mildewed wood is ever present, but here it seems somehow cooler, more sterile. I shiver involuntarily, taken by the sudden chill in this part of the hallway. I pause for a moment and listen. It almost sounds like, like someone quietly crying, but I can't be sure. Maybe it's just in my head. Swallowing the lump of fear in my throat, I avert my eyes and continue my way along the corridor, feeling oddly relieved as I move past room 237. Just a room, I tell myself, even as my heart continues to race uncomfortably in my chest. I finish my rounds without further incident, my thoughts returning time and again to the closed door and the unnerving silence behind it. When I reach the security room again, my hands are clammy, and my mind is a jumble of paranoid thoughts. I know Ted didn't care about the rules, but something about room 237 has me on edge, like a nagging sense of foreboding that I can't quite rationalize. By the time I settle back into the control room and start cycling through the various camera feeds, it's nearly midnight. The dimly lit hallways are empty and still, the camera's grainy images revealing nothing amiss. My eyes flick to the monitor, displaying the corridor outside room 237, and I listen intently for any sounds, finding none. I look back at the list of rules and shake my head, rereading them again. None of this makes any sense. A woman in a white gown? This has to be some sort of bullshit, probably some prank the last guy played on the new guard. I relax a little and even grin at the thought. Just then, I hear the faintest sound of crying through the static from the speakers and freeze, crushing the paper in my hand. My heartbeat quickens as I scan the monitors, searching for anything unusual. When my eyes reach the one displaying room 237, I feel a chill running down my back. This has to be some sort of joke, I think, probably something Ted set up to scare the new guy. I start to relax again and turn away from the monitor, but then I catch some movement on one of the screens. My heart skips a beat as my eyes widen. There she is, moving slowly across the room, her pale visage obscured by her dark, tangled hair. I know the rule. I should turn away. But I find myself frozen, unable to tear my eyes away from the monitoring station. She doesn't seem to notice me. She doesn't really seem threatening at all, if I'm being honest, just calmly walking the corridors, moving with that fluid, graceful motion. At last, I manage to wrench my gaze away from the monitor, my heart pounding in my chest. I quickly cycle the power to the monitor, attempting to rationalize it as a malfunction or some anomaly of the antiquated system. But when the image returns, she remains unabated. By the time my shift ends, I'm a frayed bundle of nerves. As the first rays of morning sunlight pierce the gloom of the asylum, I depart the building with a curious mix of relief and anxiety. My thoughts drift back to the spectral woman in the tattered white gown, and I find myself questioning my decision to take this job. Still, beneath the unease, there's an inexplicable thrill, a morbid curiosity. The second night at the asylum is beginning, and I find myself back in the control room, thoughts drifting to the apparition of the woman in white and the inexplicable crying from the previous night outside of the room 237. I drop into the chair and glance over the monitors, relieved to see nothing but deserted hallways and dim light. When I begin my patrol, I'm a bit jumpy, every noise the building makes causing my pulse to quicken and my breath to catch in my throat. More than once, I find myself leaping back from some imagined movement, my flashlight trembling in my hand as I reluctantly shine it upon the offending spot, only to realize it was nothing but some shadow cast by my light upon something along the walls. When I reach room 237, my steps slow once again, and my ears strain to hear the faintest sound of the mysterious crying that had chilled my soul the night before, but am greeted only by the absence of sound. I hadn't realized I'd been holding my breath until my chest began to ache from the lack of air. I exhaled deeply, continuing my patrol with a nervous shiver. Returning to the security station, I find myself eyeing the monitors uneasily, particularly the one showing the hallway in front of room 237. The woman in white is nowhere to be seen, and I watch the vacant hallway for a moment before shaking my head and turning my attention elsewhere. I spend the next couple of hours reviewing some unrelated notes and papers I discovered in the security station, trying to ignore the bizarre rules and calm my nervous mind. Halfway through the night, I hear something that causes me to freeze in my chair, eyes flicking up to the bank of monitors. There it is again, a muffled whimpering, so soft that it's barely picked up by the microphones in room 237. 
I feel my heart rate increase and blood pounds in my ears as I remember the rule. I shouldn't listen. I should turn away now, but I find myself drawn in closer, straining to hear the muffled sounds of what I now recognize as sobbing, crying. My mind races as I think about the list of rules, and I briefly entertain the thought that maybe I should check on the person in the cell, that they may need help, but the rule was quite explicit. Don't open the cell no matter what I hear. It didn't say anything about needing to confirm the well-being of the person inside. With a resigned sigh, I shut off the speaker and stand there in the sudden quiet of the monitoring room, feeling a pang of guilt as I helplessly listen to the crying continue. For the rest of my shift, I am on edge, and the sounds of the sobbing haunt me even after I leave. When dawn arrives, I'm bone-weary and frazzled from lack of sleep and too many nerves. I exit the asylum as the morning sun is rising, still no clearer in my thoughts. The more I think about it, the more I begin to wonder if there is something in the history of this place, this asylum, that might provide some insight into what the hell is going on here, some explanation for the strange occurrences I've been experiencing. The thought settles in my mind as I drive away from the asylum into the early morning light, the sun just beginning to crest the horizon. Yeah, I need to know more. A short time later, I find myself in the town library, asking the gray-haired, middle-aged woman behind the counter if they have any historical information about the old mental asylum. She eyes me curiously, but doesn't ask any questions, instead leading me to the local history section. I'm surrounded by stacks of yellowed newspapers, assorted records, and books on local history. The asylum was constructed in the latter half of the 19th century, I discover, and was hailed as a state-of-the-art facility for revolutionary and compassionate treatment of the mentally ill. Before long, I find what I'm looking for in the form of a newspaper article with a scandalous headline, The Ink Faded with Age and Time. The date at the top of the page tells me that this paper is nearly a hundred years old. I scan through the article. It provides a brief background of the conditions at the asylum, claiming that the institution was overcrowded and had been for some time. The piece recounts how the facility was overwhelmed, dangerously so, and that patients were being neglected and ignored in the frenzied efforts to accommodate more and more incoming patients. Then it goes on to discuss the staff. According to the journalist, the nurses and orderlies are poorly trained, lacking the proper knowledge and experience to tend to the needs of their charges. A handful of anonymous quotes from some of the staff are included, expressing their own fears and lack of understanding of their responsibilities. Perhaps worst of all are the doctors. The author of the article claims that their primary concern seems to be their experiments and research, rather than the health and welfare of the patients in their care. One line even reads, The physicians of Black Rock Asylum seem to view their patients as little more than experimental animals. The article states that the patients are subjected to inhumane living conditions, confined to squalid chambers, and denied basic human necessities. It describes the environment in colorful detail, filthy walls, tattered bedding, insufficient and poorly prepared meals. The article concludes with a demand for an inquiry into the affairs of the asylum, and I can almost feel the angry vitriol of the reporter in the words as I read them. When I reach the end, I set the paper down, noticing that my hands are trembling slightly as I process what I've just read. I wonder darkly if the spirits haunting me during my shifts are those of the poor souls in the article. Another chill runs through me at the thought. The next article appears to be more recent, the paper less yellowed and the print more crisp. The headline reads, Whistleblower Exposes Atrocities in Asylum, and I feel my heart rate increase as I take a breath and begin reading. The piece reads, In a shocking revelation, a local nurse has come forward to expose the horrific conditions within the city's mental institution, describing deplorable conditions and inhumane treatments that have resulted in the deaths and injuries of countless patients over the years. The nurse, who has chosen to remain anonymous out of fear for her safety, has painted a grim picture of life within the walls of the local asylum. These poor souls were treated as less than human from the moment they entered the facility, she claimed. I have personally witnessed acts of brutality and neglect that would shock even the most hardened criminal. According to the whistleblower, patients were crammed into overcrowded wards, often left for days without basic hygiene needs being met, and regularly subjected to physical abuse at the hands of the staff. Perhaps most damning of all were the nurses' accounts of the grotesque experiments performed on patients in the name of science. 
They fancied themselves as pioneers of psychiatric medicine, she said, but the truth is they were little more than sadists. The nurse described unethical procedures and treatments, including unsanctioned drug trials, painful surgeries, and excessive electroconvulsive therapy sessions. The conditions weren't any better, she claims. Food was infrequent and often unfit to eat. Sanitation was all but non-existent. Violence and suicide were common. It was hell, she says, a living hell. Most disturbing is her assertion that the staff made no effort to protect the patients or to care for their emotional needs. If a patient cried out in fear, if they begged for release, it was ignored. They were powerless and without recourse. She claims that she is only coming forward now in the hopes that the atrocities committed within the walls of the asylum will be exposed and that the victims will somehow be able to receive justice. No human being should have to endure what these patients did, she says. The world needs to know what happened to them. I feel a sense of revulsion as I read her words, able to imagine her impassioned voice as she delivers her damning accusations. While it all sounds horrible and explains some of the events I've been experiencing on my rounds, it still doesn't provide the details I need. One account describes some sort of patient uprising and riot that resulted in the deaths of multiple staff and patients. I read personal accounts and letters from patients who had formerly been committed here, who described being restrained in straitjackets for hours at a time, kept in dark and cramped solitary confinement rooms, subjected to electroconvulsive therapy and lobotomy while insufficiently anesthetized. I read about more than a few people who died within these walls, both staff and patients, and more than a few of the written accounts mentioned strange incidents, such as doors locking and unlocking on their own, lights flickering, and even disembodied cries and wails emanating from within the walls of the building. At least one letter from a former patient even suggested that patients were being physically assaulted by invisible hands, though the doctors believed it all to be paranoid delusion. But nowhere can I find any information about what I've encountered here, or what room 237 was, or who the woman in white was. I can find plenty of information about the atrocities that occurred here, but nothing that helps me piece together anything useful. I was on one of my patrols, walking the seemingly endless corridors of the asylum with the flashlight lighting my path and my monotonous footfalls echoing in the dark hinterland beyond its beam. That night felt different, like something was building, some unknown tension humming throughout the building. I was about halfway through my patrol, having passed the various rooms containing stacks of unused and dusty renovation and restoration supplies, when my light fell upon something odd. It was an unmarked, aged wooden door at the end of an unused corridor. I freeze, and my breath catches in my throat. This door wasn't here before. I've walked this beat a thousand times and never seen it. It wasn't on the building schematic either. I'd looked it over pretty thoroughly when I started working here. A chill settles over me and the hairs on my neck stand on end. My hand reaches out and touches the tarnished brass door handle, cold and gritty with age. Something in the back of my mind is screaming at me to just leave it, to keep walking and forget about it. But I can't. I know that something inside here will give me the answers I need. As much as I'm terrified to find out, I know I have to see what's inside. I take a slow, deep breath and let it out, before turning the handle and pushing the door inward. The door swings inward with a long squeal of protest and I hesitate briefly before stepping inside, letting my eyes adjust to the dim light. It's some sort of records room, medium-sized and lined with metal filing cabinets, many of which are leaning askew, and a few of which have fallen over completely, spilling their contents across the dusty concrete floor. It looks like nobody has been in this room for ages. A few cardboard boxes are stacked haphazardly against the wall on the far side of the room, their corners faded and frayed, a few with their tops collapsed in. A wooden desk stands nearby, covered with various stacks of papers and a few leather-bound volumes. The light from my flashlight plays across the stacks of boxes and the cabinets and papers around me. The air is thick and musty, and I find myself coughing a bit as I involuntarily stir up little clouds of dust with my movements. With more trepidation than I'd like to admit, I reach out with one hand and grab one of the rusted handles adorning the front of the nearest filing cabinet. It slides open with a metallic groan of protest, exposing rows of faded and time-worn manila folders, each one bearing a handwritten label with various patient names and numbers. I grab one at random and lift it from the drawer, 
grimacing at the way the brittle paper crinkles under my clumsy fingers. The first folder is titled Patient 365 Amelia B, and the pages are yellowed with age. Patient 365 Amelia B, admitted to asylum July 12, 1917. Symptoms of insomnia, hysteria, and visual hallucinations. Diagnosis of acute hysteria and hallucinations. The pages that follow tell the story of her time here at the asylum, and it's both depressing and terrifying. She began her stay here, restless and fearful, and within days was being forcibly sedated and subjected to isolation and treatment sessions. The notes from the physician treating her are sickening. There's an almost blasé manner in which he describes the use of electroshock therapy and ice baths. March 25, 1919. Subject 365 still uncooperative. Will increase voltage at next electroconvulsive therapy session. The patient must understand that we are here to help her. April 2, 1919. Amelia insisted she saw the woman in white again. Hysteria was uncontrollable. Subject sedated and confined to isolation. With each page I scan, I find more of the same, detailing the vile atrocities that this poor woman had been subjected to. My vision blurs, and I realize that the pages are shaking as I hold them. It suddenly feels difficult to draw a full breath, and I'm aware of a deep pain in my chest. A profound sense of sorrow fills me, and I realize with some surprise that I'm mourning for this woman, this Amelia, whom I've never known. The final page of the file has only a brief entry. June 3, 1920, patient 365 expired in room 237, unknown cause. So cold and detached, clinical in its emotionless reporting of such a horrible event. I lean back in my chair, my heart racing. I can hardly believe what I'm reading. This poor woman, this poor girl. And it certainly sounds like it could have been the woman in room 237, doesn't it? I shudder involuntarily. With a trembling breath, I set the file aside and slide the drawer closed, standing and stepping over to the cardboard boxes. The files hadn't been promising, but maybe the boxes contained something different. Reaching into one, I pull out a stack of yellowed papers and folders, overflowing with what looks like newspaper clippings, photographs, and handwritten notes. I turn to one of the journals and open it. The handwriting is neat and orderly. One of the journals seems to have several entries regarding another patient and are all titled with Patient 481, Thomas R. May 1532, admitted patient 481, Thomas R. today, exhibits extreme paranoia and delusional beliefs that he is being hunted by men of shadow. Diagnosed with Paranoia Disorder May 22, 1932, no change in Thomas's condition. Patient continues to be agitated, ranting in hushed tones about shadow men. Prescribe sedatives daily and continue cold water immersions as planned. June 5, 1932. Patient did not respond as expected to today's treatment. Upon completion of immersion treatment, Thomas became exceedingly agitated, crying out that the shadows were inside him. Restrain and sedate as needed. July 1, 1932. Continued difficulties with Thomas. Even with increased sedation, he awakens in the night, terrified, claims the shadow men are real, that they are within him. Evaluate for electroconvulsive therapy. July 20th, 1932, administered the first ECT therapy session today, troubling observations immediately afterward. Patient was unusually sedate and mute, completely non-reactive to stimuli, even to the threat blink reflex. Simply sat motionless and gazed at the wall in front of him. Will continue to observe. August 15th, 1932. Patient Thomas remains catatonic and uncommunicative. Patient has shown no signs of voluntary movement or interaction with environment since initial treatment. Continues to sit motionless and stare vacantly. Have never witnessed anything like this. September 2nd, 1932. Patient Thomas discovered deceased in his room today, presented as he has been since treatment. No known cause of death. Heart simply stopped. Very disturbing result. A chill knot forms in my gut as I read Dr. Graham's words. Something about the clinical way he describes his observations somehow seems to heighten the horror and revulsion I feel. This place, this asylum, wasn't just a place where unfortunate souls were housed. It was a house of suffering and anguish. I can feel my heart beginning to race as I read about the injustices visited upon those left, 
in the charge of this institution. My hands are trembling by the time I put the journal back down on the desktop and look around the room again, now with a greater understanding of the hopelessness and misery that must have permeated these walls. For a moment, I think I can almost hear their lamentations and cries, feel their anguish and despair. I shake my head to clear it. I need to move to get out of this room. I take one more glance at the piles of files and papers scattered around the room and head back to the door. Every instinct I have is telling me to run, to get the hell out of here, and never come back. But I know I can't. I step out into the hallway again, closing the door behind me. The light here seems dimmer than it was before, and I feel a chill run through me, goosebumps rising. I force myself to relax. As I return to my office, the weight of the asylum feels heavier, more threatening. I understand now that the rules are not a figment of someone's paranoia. They're real. I sit here, in my office, watching the surveillance monitors cycle through the various views of darkened and dusty hallways, empty rooms, and long-forgotten locked doors. It's been a few days since I stumbled across that hidden room with all the furniture and belongings still in it, and I still feel a bit unsettled by the whole thing. Something about this place feels different to me now, almost like it's not too keen on me exposing its secrets and bringing them out into the light. But even with this uncomfortable feeling, I still have my patrols to do. When I came back from my last patrol, the sound of my footsteps echoing off the stone walls and floors of the corridors, I couldn't shake the discomfort that took hold of me when I passed by room 237. The door stood there, silent and unmoving as it always had, but now the awareness of what it used to be, who it used to belong to, just seemed to follow me like a dark shadow. Back in my office, I drop myself into the beat-up chair with a heavy sigh, muscles still tense with unease. The monitors provide a dull glow in the dim light, flickering images of the silent hallways, reassuring me with their emptiness, though I've long since learned to distrust such calm. As I try to relax, a distant creaking sound resonates through the building, reverberating along the walls like a low moan. I sit bolt upright and listen closer. There it is again, louder now and more recognizable. The creaking sound of a door slowly opening. My heart skips a beat as I leap from my chair and focus on the monitor displaying the hallway outside room 237. The door now stands partially open, no longer held fast by the lock. I feel the blood drain from my face. This isn't happening, I say aloud to myself, staring at the monitor. But it is happening. I don't understand any of it, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Lost in my own thoughts, I almost miss the sound of movement, like a shuffling of some sort of fabric on the ground, directly in front of me. I can hear my heart thundering in my ears, that same sound now coming from just outside the doorway, in the hall. As much as I want to just stay here, to ignore it, I know I can't. Sucking in a deep breath, I push myself up from the chair, unclenching my fists and stepping around the desk towards the doorway. The shuffling sound persists. Taking one last breath, I shove the door open and step through it into the shadowed hallway beyond. The muted light from the now open doorway falls upon the lithe form of the woman in white, blank black eyes locked upon me. Her pallid skin sags from her narrow frame, wisps of dark hair partially obscuring her face. She stands motionless, her tattered and stained gown hanging loosely from her bony shoulders, and I feel my heart skip a beat as icy fingers of fear grip my chest. I feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end, and the chill in the air seems to deepen. For a long moment, nothing moves, and it feels as if even sound itself has fled from this place. Slowly, the woman raises one outstretched arm and points directly at me, and my mind screams in primal fear. The woman doesn't answer. For one terrible second, I think she's just going to stand there motionless until the light bulb burns out, leaving me there in the dark with her. But then she throws her head back, and I hear that banshee wail again, its ear splitting and filled with an incomprehensible anguish and fury. The inhuman shriek reverberates off the tile walls of the corridor, and then she's moving. The flowing fabric of her nightgown streams behind her as her bare feet patter silently on the tiled floor, carrying her unnervingly fast, directly towards me. The icy fingers of terror grip my racing heart, threatening to freeze the blood in my veins. I'm unable to think, unable to move, as I'm forced to watch her approach, her horrifying visage growing clearer with each passing millisecond. 
And then my rational mind takes over, and my survival instincts scream at me. I spin around on my heel. I fling myself down the hall away from the white-gowned woman. Her screech continues unabated, ear-splitting in its volume, and seeming to reverberate from the very walls around me. I don't need to look back to know she's chasing after me. I can almost feel her withered, yellow-nailed fingers reaching for me, grasping at my coat. The urge to glance back, to see how close she is, almost overwhelms me, but I know if I do that, I'll lose my momentum, my speed, and she'll be on me. I can hear her. The fluttering of her gown and the fleshy slapping of her unshod feet on the tiled floor behind me feel her hot breath on my neck. The only thing that keeps my legs churning is the certain knowledge that if I falter, if I stumble, if I slow even for a moment, she will be upon me. The silent halls of the asylum are suddenly filled with the sounds of my flight and her pursuit. My heart beats a thunderous rhythm in my ears, the rush of fear and adrenaline pushing me onward. I take a left around a bank of cells, a more direct route I know will lead me to the exit. The dim glow of the emergency lights flicker as I pass, casting ominous shadows along the walls of the cells I race past. I can't slow. I can't stop. I don't dare. I hear her cries behind me, growing louder and more anguished with every step I take away from her. I risk another glance back behind me, and my heart freezes in my chest as I see her there, the pale woman in white, eyes wide and staring, reaching towards me pleadingly. I gasp aloud and whip my head back around, my lungs burning with exertion. I'm so close, so close. There, I can see the exit ahead. The dim light from the street beyond casts a dull glow through the glass double doors. Relief floods my senses for a brief moment until the icy grip of fear clenches my gut again. I'm almost there. I don't slow, willing my burning legs to carry me faster, even as my chest heaves with the effort. The screaming suddenly cuts off, leaving only the pounding of my footsteps and racing heart in my ears. But I know she's still there. I can feel her, impossibly, right behind me, reaching for me. My shoulder slams into the crash bar of the door, and it explodes outward, spilling me into the freezing night. I go down hard, tumbling down the few steps and crashing to my knees on the gravel path. The door to the asylum slowly swings shut, and I realize the woman in the gown is no longer in sight. I'm not about to wait around to see if she decides to come out after me. I leap to my feet and race to my car, parked only a few yards away. As my trembling hands fumble with the keys, I hear the distant creak of the door behind me, but I'm not interested in seeing who or what is coming out. I dive into the seat, slam the door, and fire up the engine, pulling away as quickly as I can. Even now, as I'm driving away, my hands are shaking so badly I can barely keep the car on the road. My eyes flick to the rearview mirror, back to the silhouetted hulk of the asylum, its darkened windows seemingly lifeless, yet somehow so very menacing. As I drove away from that godforsaken place, the sense of horror slowly began to ebb, replaced by a profound relief that I had escaped, that I had survived whatever the hell that was. I don't know what those things were, the spectral woman in white, the crying I'd heard from within room 237. But they were tied to this place, this cursed asylum, and whatever evil it had been festering for the past century. Even now, I can almost feel her cold touch upon my skin, hear that soul-searing wail echoing in my mind. But I'm getting further away. I can feel it lessening, feel the weight lifting from me as I put more and more distance between myself and that place. I don't really remember much of the drive home. The trauma of the night's events had taken their toll on me, and I was running on adrenaline and fear by the time I pulled into my driveway and got out of the car. I didn't know what was going to happen with the hotel renovation project or the next poor schmuck that they hired to take over my position, but I sure as hell wasn't going to stick around to find out. I just hoped that whoever it was followed the rules, and maybe they'd have better luck than I did. One thing I did know, as I stepped into my house and the first rays of morning light began peeking over the horizon, was that I was never going back to that place. I don't know what the hell it all was, but I wasn't planning to stick around and find out. The fog crept in like a living thing, tendrils of mist curling around tree trunks and obscuring the forest floor. I checked my watch, 4.37 p.m., daylight was fading fast, and with it my confidence. I've been hiking these trails for years, but something felt off today. The familiar landmarks I relied on seemed to have vanished, 
leaving me surrounded by an endless sea of identical trees. I pulled out my GPS, hoping it would provide some clarity. The screen flickered weakly before going dark. Dead battery? No signal? I couldn't be sure. Either way, I was on my own now. Stay calm, Sarah, I muttered to myself. You've got this. But as the minutes ticked by and darkness settled over the woods, panic began to set in. The trees loomed larger, their branches reaching out like gnarled fingers. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision. Was it just my imagination, or were the trees actually shifting around me? A chill wind cut through my jacket. The temperature was dropping rapidly, far faster than normal for this time of year. My breath came out in visible puffs as I hugged myself for warmth. That's when I heard it, a low, mournful howl echoing through the trees. It was joined by other eerie sounds, rustling leaves, creaking branches, and something that sounded disturbingly like whispers. My heart raced as I picked up my pace, no longer caring which direction I went as long as it was away from those sounds. Rain began to fall, icy droplets stinging my face. Within minutes, I was soaked to the bone and shivering uncontrollably. Exhaustion weighed heavily on me. How long had I been walking? Hours? Days? Time seemed to have lost all meaning in this nightmarish forest. Just as I was about to collapse in despair, I saw it, a faint glow through the trees. Hope surged through me as I stumbled towards the light. As I drew closer, I could make out the silhouette of a small cabin. It looked old and worn, with weathered wooden walls and a sagging roof. But right now, it was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen. I practically fell against the door, my numb fingers fumbling with the handle. To my surprise, it swung open easily. I stumbled inside, slamming the door shut behind me and leaning against it as I caught my breath. I stepped into the cabin, my sodden clothes dripping onto the worn wooden floorboards. The warmth hit me like a wall, instantly soothing my chilled bones. A fire crackled merrily in a stone hearth, casting flickering shadows across the room. The scent of wood smoke mingled with something savory that made my stomach growl. My eyes were drawn to a pot simmering on an old cast-iron stove. Steam rose from it, carrying the aroma of herbs and meat. My mouth watered at the thought of hot stew after hours of trudging through the cold forest. I shrugged off my wet jacket, hanging it on a peg by the door. The cabin was small but cozy, with a lived-in feel that belied its seemingly abandoned exterior. A plush armchair sat invitingly near the fire, a patchwork quilt draped over its back. Bookshelves lined one wall, crammed with well-worn volumes. As I moved further into the room, something caught my eye. A clock hung on the wall, its face ornate and clearly antique. But as I watched, the hands moved steadily, counterclockwise. I blinked. Sure, I must be seeing things. But no, the clock continued its backwards journey through time. Unsettled, I turned away, only to notice something equally strange. The window to my left showed a clear night sky, stars twinkling brightly. But when I glanced at the window on the opposite wall, I saw driving rain lashing against the glass. My brow furrowed as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. Part of me knew I should be alarmed, that I should turn and flee back into the forest. But a stronger part of me felt utterly at peace here, as if I'd finally come home after a long journey. I sank into the armchair by the fire, pulling the quilt around my shoulders. The stew on the stove smelled divine, and I found myself wondering if there might be bowls in one of the cupboards. This is crazy, I muttered to myself. I don't even know whose house this is. But even as I said the words, they felt hollow. Some deeper part of me insisted that I belonged here, that I'd been expected. The fire popped and crackled, as if in agreement. I jolted awake, my heart pounding. A deafening crack had shattered the peaceful silence of the cabin. For a moment, I was disoriented, struggling to remember where I was. Then it all came flooding back, the forest, the fog, finding the strange yet comforting shelter. But as my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I realized something was terribly wrong. The cozy cabin I'd fallen asleep in had vanished. In its place was a dilapidated ruin. The walls, once solid and inviting, were now crumbling, with yellowed wallpaper peeling away in long strips. The floorboards creaked ominously beneath me as I stood, sending up small clouds of dust. A musty, dank smell assaulted my nostrils, reminiscent of long-abandoned places in decay. 
The fire that had burned so cheerfully in the hearth was nothing but cold ashes now. The clock on the wall had stopped, its hands frozen at an impossible angle. "'What the hell?' I whispered, my voice sounding unnaturally loud in the oppressive silence. I stumbled towards the front door, my mind reeling. This couldn't be the same place. It was as if decades had passed, in the span of a few hours. My hand trembled as I reached for the doorknob, dreading what I might find outside. The door creaked open, and I gasped. Gone was the misty forest I'd stumbled through. Instead, a vast red desert stretched as far as the eye could see. The sun hung low on the horizon, bathing everything in an eerie, blood-red glow. Dunes of rusty sand rippled to the horizon, broken only by the occasional jutting rock formation. The air that rushed in was hot and dry, carrying the scent of dust and something alien I couldn't quite place. In the distance, I saw what looked like the skeletal remains of long-dead trees, their branches reaching towards the sky like gnarled fingers. Panic clawed at my throat. This was impossible. It had to be a dream, a hallucination. I pinched myself hard, wincing at the pain, but the surreal landscape remained unchanged. No, 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 I muttered, backing away from the door. This isn't real. It can't be real. I slammed the door shut, leaning against it as if I could hold back the impossible world outside through sheer force of will. My breath came in ragged gasps as I tried to make sense of what was happening. The cabin creaked and groaned around me, as if it too was struggling to maintain its form in this alien environment. Dust motes danced in the sickly light, filtering through grimy windows. The musty smell seemed stronger now, tinged with something acrid that made my eyes water. I slid down to the floor, hugging my knees to my chest. The rough wood of the door pressed against my back, the only thing that felt solid and real in this nightmare. I squeezed my eyes shut, willing myself to wake up, to find myself back in the normal world. But when I opened them again, nothing had changed. The decrepit cabin still surrounded me, a far cry from the welcoming shelter I'd found in the forest. And beyond its walls lay a desert that shouldn't, couldn't exist. I buried my face in my hands, trying to stifle the sobs that threatened to overwhelm me. What was happening? Where was I? And more importantly, how could I get back home? I stood up on shaky legs, my mind reeling as I tried to process the impossible changes around me. The dilapidated cabin creaked and groaned, as if struggling to maintain its form in this alien environment. Dust motes danced in the sickly light, filtering through grimy windows. The musty smell seemed stronger now, tinged with something acrid that made my eyes water. My gaze fell on a door I hadn't noticed before. It must lead to the living room. With trembling fingers, I grasped the tarnished brass knob and turned it slowly. The door swung open with a drawn-out creak that set my teeth on edge. I gasped as a wave of humid air washed over me. Where there should have been a normal living room, a lush jungle sprawled before my eyes. Massive trees towered overhead, their canopies blocking out most of the light. Vines draped from branch to branch, and exotic flowers bloomed in vibrant hues I'd never seen before. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and vegetation. This isn't possible, I whispered, but my words were swallowed by the cacophony of jungle sounds. Birds calling, insects buzzing, leaves rustling in an unfelt breeze. I took a hesitant step forward, leaves and fallen fronds crunching beneath my feet. The door swung shut behind me with a soft click, and when I whirled around, it had vanished completely. My heart raced as I realized I was now fully immersed in this impossible jungle. As I moved deeper into the foliage, pushing aside giant leaves and ducking under low-hanging vines, an uneasy feeling crept over me. The jungle sounds seemed to shift, growing quieter in some areas while intensifying in others. It felt as if the very air was watching me. A twig snapped somewhere to my left, and I froze. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I sensed rather than saw movement in the undergrowth. Something large was out there, stalking me. I caught a glimpse of sleek, dark fur through a gap in the leaves. A low growl rumbled through the air, setting my nerves on fire. Whatever this creature was, it wasn't like any animal I'd ever encountered. My breath came in short, panicked gasps as I backed away slowly. Leaves rustled as the unseen predator moved closer. 
I caught another glimpse, gleaming eyes that seemed to glow with an unnatural light, razor-sharp claws that left deep gouges in the tree bark. Terror propelled me into action. I turned and ran, no longer caring about the direction, focused only on escape. Branches whipped at my face and arms as I crashed through the underbrush. The creature's growl rose to a roar, the sound so alien and terrifying that it sent shivers down my spine. I burst through a curtain of vines and found myself back in the main hall of the cabin. Without thinking, I slammed the door shut just as something massive collided with it from the other side. An otherworldly roar shook the entire structure, vibrating through my bones. I climbed the creaking stairs, my heart pounding with each step. The worn wood groaned beneath my feet as if protesting my ascent. At the top, a long hallway stretched before me, lined with numerous doors on both sides. The faded wallpaper peeled in places, revealing glimpses of the plaster beneath. I approached the first door on my right, my hand trembling as I reached for the tarnished brass knob. It turned with surprising ease, and I pushed the door open. My jaw dropped. Instead of the dusty, abandoned room I'd expected, I found myself staring into a stark, white, futuristic laboratory. The contrast was so jarring that for a moment I thought I must be hallucinating. Hesitantly, I stepped inside. The air was cool and sterile, carrying a faint chemical scent. Bright fluorescent lights hummed overhead, casting a harsh glow over the gleaming surfaces. Banks of computers lined the walls, their screens displaying incomprehensible data and diagrams. But what truly caught my attention were the rows of large cylindrical tubes that dominated the center of the room. Each was filled with a pale blue liquid, bubbles rising lazily to the surface. And floating within each tube was a humanoid figure. I moved closer, my curiosity overriding my fear. The figures appeared to be in some sort of stasis, their eyes closed and limbs floating weightlessly in the liquid. As I peered into one of the tubes, my blood ran cold. The face staring back at me was my own. I stumbled backward, my mind reeling. It was impossible, and yet there it was, a perfect replica of me, suspended in that eerie blue fluid. I looked from tube to tube, realizing with growing horror that each contained a slightly different version of myself. Some looked older, some younger, some bore scars or alterations I couldn't begin to comprehend. A sudden, piercing alarm shattered the silence. Red lights began to flash, and a computerized voice blared from hidden speakers. Alert! Unauthorized presence detected, initiating security protocols. Panic seized me. I spun around, ready to flee, only to find that the door I'd entered through had vanished. The smooth white walls showed no sign of an exit. The alarm continued to wail as I frantically searched for a way out. The tubes began to bubble more vigorously, and I could have sworn I saw one of my doppelgangers twitch. My heart raced as I pounded on the walls, desperation mounting with each passing second. Just as I was about to give in to despair, a section of the wall slid open, revealing the hallway beyond. I didn't hesitate. I bolted through the opening, not daring to look back. The alarm faded as I ran, replaced by the sound of my own ragged breathing and pounding footsteps on the creaking floorboards. I found myself back in the dilapidated hallway, surrounded once more by peeling wallpaper and worn wood. The door to the futuristic lab had vanished as if it had never existed. Gasping for breath, I leaned against the wall, trying to make sense of what I'd just experienced. The image of those tubes, filled with versions of myself, was burned into my mind. What were they? Why were they there? And what would have happened if I'd been caught? I descended the creaky wooden stairs into the basement, my heart pounding with each step. The air grew colder and damper as I ventured deeper underground. At the bottom, I found myself in a dark, cavernous space that seemed to stretch far beyond the confines of the house above. As my eyes adjusted to the gloom, I noticed an eerie blue-green glow emanating from patches on the walls and floor. Phosphorescent fungi clung to the damp stone, casting strange shadows that seemed to writhe and dance in my peripheral vision. The light was just enough to reveal ancient cave paintings covering the rocky surfaces. I moved closer to examine one of the paintings, a crude depiction of humanoid figures engaged in some kind of ritual. As I stared, a chill ran down my spine. The figures appeared to be moving, their limbs twitching and contorting in a silent, primitive dance. I blinked hard, convinced it must be a trick of the light, 
but when I looked again, the movement continued. A faint whisper reached my ears, barely audible at first. It grew steadily louder, a sibilant hiss in a language I couldn't understand. The words, if they were words, seemed to slither through the air, wrapping around me like incorporeal tendrils. Hello? I called out, my voice echoing off the cave walls. Is anyone there? The whispers intensified in response, a cacophony of otherworldly voices that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. I spun around, trying to locate the source, but the cavern appeared empty, save for the glowing fungi and animated cave paintings. A cold draft brushed against my skin, carrying with it the musty scent of age and decay. The whispers grew louder still, and I had the distinct impression that unseen presences were closing in around me. The air felt thick and heavy, pressing down on me from all sides. Panic seized me as the voices reached a fever pitch. I could feel them now, invisible entities brushing against me, their touch leaving trails of icy coldness on my skin. The cave paintings seemed to writhe more violently, the primitive figures reaching out as if trying to break free from the stone. I stumbled backward, my foot catching on an unseen obstacle. As I regained my balance, I realized with horror that the stairs had vanished. The cavern stretched out in all directions, with no sign of the way I had come. The whispers formed a deafening chorus now, filled with an urgency and malevolence that sent waves of terror through me. I could no longer distinguish individual sounds or words, just an overwhelming cacophony that threatened to drive me mad. Desperate, I picked a direction at random and ran. My feet pounded against the stone floor as I sprinted through the twisting caverns, the phosphorescent fungi blurring into streaks of sickly light. The whispers pursued me, growing louder and more frenzied with each step. Just as I felt my strength failing, my outstretched hand struck wood. A door. I grasped the handle and wrenched it open, throwing myself through the opening. I slammed it shut behind me, cutting off the whispers mid-syllable. I stepped into the kitchen, my nerves still frayed from the encounter in the basement. The familiar sight of worn countertops and outdated appliances offered a brief moment of normalcy. I leaned against the sink, trying to catch my breath and make sense of everything I'd experienced. Suddenly, the air around me shimmered, like heat waves rising from hot pavement. I blinked, and when I opened my eyes, the kitchen had transformed completely. Gone were the modern appliances, replaced by a massive stone hearth and rough-hewn wooden tables. Herbs hung from the rafters, and the smell of wood smoke filled the air. What the— I gasped, spinning around to take in the medieval scene. A door burst open, and a man in blood-stained chainmail stumbled in, brandishing a sword. His wild eyes locked onto me, and he raised his weapon with a snarl. I ducked just as the blade whistled over my head, embedding itself in the wooden beam behind me. Heart pounding, I scrambled away on all fours, searching desperately for a way out. The air shimmered again, and the medieval kitchen dissolved. In its place, sleek metal surfaces and glowing screens appeared. Robotic arms whirred and clicked, preparing meals with inhuman precision. I barely had time to process the change when one of the robotic arms jerked violently, spraying sparks. It swung towards me, its sharp appendages snapping like pincers. No, 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 I cried, diving under a nearby counter. The malfunctioning robot smashed into the spot where I'd been standing, leaving a deep gouge in the metal surface. I crawled frantically, dodging falling debris as more machines began to short-circuit around me. Just as I thought I couldn't take any more, the air shimmered once again. The futuristic kitchen melted away, replaced by a primordial scene. Massive ferns and strange ancient plants surrounded me. The air was thick and humid, filled with the buzz of prehistoric insects. A low growl froze me in place. Slowly I turned to see a velociraptor stalking towards me, its sickle-shaped claws clicking against the stone floor. Its eyes gleamed with predatory intelligence as it sized me up. I backed away slowly, my mind racing. The shifts seemed to happen every few minutes. If I could just survive until the next one. The raptor lunged, and I threw myself to the side, feeling the rush of air as its jaws snapped shut inches from my leg. I scrambled to my feet and ran, weaving between the giant ferns. The air began to shimmer, and I silently prayed for the next shift to come quickly. The raptor's hot breath was on my heels as the prehistoric world began to dissolve around us.
With a final burst of speed, I leapt forward just as the kitchen transformed once again. I crashed into a familiar countertop, the impact knocking the wind out of me. Gasping, I spun around. But the velociraptor was gone. I was back in the normal, run-down kitchen of the house. I pushed open the bathroom door, my hand trembling on the tarnished brass knob. The hinges creaked ominously as I stepped inside, my eyes adjusting to the dim light filtering through a grimy window. The air was thick with the musty scent of mold and disuse. My gaze fell on the large mirror above the sink, its surface clouded with age. As I approached, I expected to see my own haggard reflection staring back at me. Instead, I gasped in shock. The mirror didn't show my reflection at all. Instead, I saw a version of myself I didn't recognize. This Sarah stood taller, her posture confident, and her clothes immaculate. She smiled at me, a look of pity in her eyes. What the hell? I whispered, reaching out to touch the glass. The image shifted, and I recoiled in horror. Now I saw myself twisted and deformed, my skin mottled, and my limbs bent at unnatural angles. This Sarah's eyes were filled with pain and desperation. I stumbled backward. The mirror's surface rippled like water, and another version of me appeared. This one looked older, with streaks of gray in her hair and lines of worry etched into her face. She seemed to be shouting, but I couldn't hear her words. More versions of myself flashed across the mirror's surface, each one different from the last. I saw myself as a celebrated scientist, holding a Nobel Prize, then as a homeless woman, huddled on a street corner, a soldier in combat fatigues, a bedridden invalid. The images came faster and faster, a dizzying kaleidoscope of possible lives. Stop! I cried out, covering my eyes with my hands, but I couldn't block out the knowledge of what I was seeing. These were all me, all versions of Sarah from different realities. The thought made my head spin. When I lowered my hands, I saw that one image had stabilized in the mirror. It was me, but with a wild, desperate look in her eyes. This Sarah pressed her hands against the glass from the other side, her mouth moving frantically. I took a step closer, straining to understand what she was trying to say. Suddenly, her hand shot through the surface of the mirror, shattering the barrier between our realities. Her fingers grasped at the air, trying to reach me. I screamed and stumbled backward, tripping over the edge of the bathtub and falling hard onto the cold tile floor. The other Sarah's arm flailed wildly, stretching impossibly far as she tried to drag me into her world. Panic surged through me. I scrambled to my feet, looking around frantically for something, anything to defend myself. My eyes fell on a heavy ceramic soap dish sitting on the edge of the sink. Without thinking, I grabbed it and hurled it at the mirror with all my strength. The glass shattered with a deafening crash, fragments flying in every direction. I threw my arms up to protect my face, feeling sharp stings as shards sliced into my skin. When I lowered my arms, I saw that each broken piece of the mirror had become a tiny portal. In one, I glimpsed a world of fire and ash. In another, a lush paradise. Countless realities, countless versions of myself, all visible in the scattered fragments. The arm that had reached through was gone, leaving behind only a smear of blood on the remaining shards. But as I watched, horrified, I saw movement in several of the larger pieces, more versions of myself pressing against the boundaries of their realities trying to break through. I backed away, my shoes crunching on broken glass. My breath came in ragged gasps as I tried to process what I was seeing. The bathroom door seemed miles away, but I knew I had to reach it. I couldn't stay here, surrounded by these fractured glimpses of other lives, other selves. With a final, terrified look at the shattered mirror and its myriad portals, I turned and ran from the bathroom. I slammed the door behind me, leaning against it as if my weight could keep the horrors contained. I climbed the narrow staircase to the attic, dust motes swirling in the beam of my flashlight. The wooden steps creaked ominously under my weight as I ascended. At the top, I pushed open a heavy trap door and hoisted myself into the musty space beyond. The attic stretched out before me, a vast repository of forgotten treasures and discarded memories. Cobwebs draped every surface like gossamer curtains, and the air was thick with the scent of old paper and aging wood. My flashlight beam cut through the gloom, revealing stacks of cardboard boxes, trunks with rusted latches, and shelves sagging under the weight of dusty tomes. 
I moved cautiously through the cramped space, my footsteps muffled by years of accumulated dust. The floorboards groaned beneath me, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the entire attic might collapse at any moment, sending me plummeting to the floors below. As I explored, my light fell upon an ornate writing desk, tucked away in a corner. Its surface was cluttered with papers and leather-bound books, as if someone had been working there only moments ago and stepped away. I approached slowly, drawn by an inexplicable pull. Among the scattered papers, a particular journal caught my eye. It was bound in dark leather, its cover embossed with strange symbols that seemed to shimmer in the flashlight's beam. With trembling hands, I picked it up and opened it to the first page. The handwriting inside was cramped and hurried, as if the author had been racing against time to record their thoughts. I squinted in the dim light, struggling to make out the words. Project Nexus, Day 1. The cabin's construction is complete. If my calculations are correct, it should serve as a focal point for interdimensional energies. God help me if I'm wrong. My heart began to race as I flipped through the pages, skimming the entries. The journal detailed the cabin's creation by a brilliant but possibly mad physicist. He had designed it as an experiment in interdimensional travel, a way to bridge the gap between realities. But, as I read on, the entries grew darker, more frantic. Day 37. Something's wrong. The cabin. It's alive somehow. I can feel it pulsing with energy, growing stronger. And the fear. Dear God, the fear is overwhelming. Day 53. It feeds on us. Our terror. Our very life force. Each victim makes it stronger, more unstable. I've tried to leave, to warn others, but it won't let me go. I'm trapped in my own creation. My hands shook as I turned to the final entry. To whoever finds this, run. Get out while you still can. The cabin is hungry and it will never stop. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for what I've unleashed. The journal slipped from my numb fingers, thudding softly on the dusty floor. My mind reeled as I tried to process what I'd just read. The cabin as a living entity, feeding on fear and life force? It seemed impossible and yet... A soft creaking sound behind me made me whirl around, my heart leaping into my throat. But there was nothing there, just shadows and dust. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the very walls of the attic were closing in around me. I snatched up the journal again, clutching it to my chest. Whatever was happening in this place, this might be the key to understanding it, and possibly escaping. But as I turned to leave, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. The trap door I'd come through was gone. Where it had been was now just more floorboards, as if it had never existed at all. I spun in a circle, my flashlight beam dancing wildly across the attic. But there was no sign of an exit, no way out. Panic began to rise in my chest, threatening to overwhelm me. I forced myself to take deep breaths, trying to stay calm. Panicking would only feed the cabin, make it stronger. I had to think had to find a way out of this nightmare. But even as I struggled to maintain my composure, I could feel the cabin's malevolent presence pressing in on me. The walls seemed to pulse with an otherworldly energy, and whispers just beyond the edge of hearing tickled at my consciousness. I stumbled through the cabin's hallway, my vision blurring as exhaustion and fear took their toll. The walls around me seemed to pulse and shift, reality bending before my eyes. I blinked hard, trying to focus, but when I opened my eyes again, the scene had changed completely. The wooden floorboards beneath my feet gave way to lush grass dotted with wildflowers. To my left, the wall had transformed into a dense forest, trees stretching impossibly high into a twilight sky. On my right, the wall rippled like water, revealing glimpses of a bustling cityscape beyond. I took a tentative step forward, my shoes sinking into the soft earth. The air felt thick, charged with an otherworldly energy that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. As I moved, the environment continued to shift and change around me. A gust of wind blew past, carrying with it the scent of sea salt. I turned to see a stretch of sandy beach had appeared, waves lapping at the shore. But the water wasn't blue, it was a deep, swirling purple, dotted with bioluminescent creatures I'd never seen before. What's happening? I whispered, said, my voice trembling. As if in response, a low rumble shook the ground beneath my feet. 
The hallway began to twist and warp, sections of different realities bleeding into one another. I watched in horror as the forest merged with the beach, trees growing out of the sand at impossible angles. The city skyline in the distance melted like wax, skyscrapers bending and flowing into new alien shapes. I pressed on. Each step brought new surprises and terrors. One moment I was wading through knee-deep snow. The next, I was dodging floating chunks of debris in a zero-gravity environment. The transitions between realities became more jarring, more chaotic. A creature scuttled past, part crab, part machine, its metal pincers clicking against the now crystalline floor. I stumbled backward, only to collide with something soft and yielding. Spinning around, I found myself face to face with a being of pure light, its form constantly shifting and pulsing. Please, I begged, though I wasn't sure if it could understand me. I need to get out of here. The light being's form flickered, and for a moment I thought I saw a human face within its glow. But before I could be sure, it dissolved into a shower of sparks, each one opening a tiny portal to yet another reality. I pushed forward, my progress becoming more difficult with each step. The hallway had become a maze of conflicting environments. In one section, I had to crawl through a narrow tunnel of rock, while the next required me to swim through a gelatinous substance that clung to my skin. Time seemed to lose all meaning. Had I been in this chaotic hallway for minutes or hours? Days? The constant shifts and changes were taking their toll on my mind. I could feel my grip on reality slipping, my thoughts becoming as fragmented as the world around me. A distant roar caught my attention. I turned to see a massive creature, part dragon, part machine, barreling towards me. Its scales gleamed with a metallic sheen, and jets of flame erupted from vents along its body. I dove to the side, rolling across a patch of what felt like bubble wrap, each pop opening a tiny window to another world. As I scrambled to my feet, I realized with growing dread that the hallway was becoming more unstable by the second. Entire sections were disappearing, replaced by swirling vortexes of energy. The boundaries between realities were breaking down completely. I have to find a way out, I gasped, forcing myself to keep moving despite the exhaustion weighing down my limbs. I could feel the cabin's hunger growing, its desire to consume me and add my essence to its chaotic tapestry of realities. The thought spurred me on, giving me a burst of desperate energy. As I ran, jumped, and crawled through the ever-changing landscape, I caught glimpses of other versions of myself. Some were trapped in their own realities, pounding against invisible barriers. Others seemed to be navigating the chaos as I was, our paths crossing for brief moments before diverging again. The hallway narrowed, the chaos intensifying. Gravity shifted wildly. One moment I was running along the ceiling, the next I was falling sideways through a field of floating crystals. My mind struggled to process the constant barrage of sensory input. Just when I thought I couldn't take any more, I spotted something ahead, a door that seemed to remain constant amidst the swirling chaos. It pulsed with an energy that felt different from the rest of the cabin, more focused and intense. I pushed myself towards it, fighting against the shifting realities that seemed determined to hold me back. As I got closer, I could feel the power emanating from beyond that door. Whatever lay behind it, I knew it held the key to understanding this place and possibly escaping it. With a final burst of effort, I reached out and grasped the doorknob. The metal felt hot under my palm, vibrating with barely contained energy. I took a deep breath, steeling myself for whatever lay beyond. I pushed open the door and stepped into a room unlike anything I had ever seen before. The walls, floor, and ceiling seemed to be made of pure energy, pulsing and shifting in a kaleidoscope of colors. At the center of the room was a swirling vortex of light, its core a blinding white that hurt my eyes to look at directly. The air crackled with electricity, making the hair on my arms stand on end. I could feel the raw power emanating from the vortex, washing over me in waves that made my skin tingle and my head spin. This, I realized, with a mixture of awe and terror, was the heart of the cabin. As I took a tentative step forward, the room around me warped and twisted. One moment I was standing on solid ground, the next, I was floating in a void filled with stars. Reality itself seemed fluid here, changing from second to second. I clutched the physicist's journal tightly to my chest, its weight the only constant in the sea of chaos. My eyes darted around, 
trying to make sense of my surroundings. In one corner, I saw a glimpse of my childhood bedroom. In another, a futuristic cityscape I didn't recognize. The visions flickered and changed faster than I could process them. Focus, Sarah, I muttered to myself, fighting against the disorientation. I forced myself to look at the vortex again, squinting against its brilliance. As I watched, I began to understand. The swirling mass of energy was the nexus point, the place where all the different realities converged. It was the source of the cabin's power, the thing that allowed it to bend and shape reality at will. I flipped open the journal, scanning the pages frantically for any information that might help. My eyes fell on a hastily scribbled note. The core must remain stable. Any significant disruption could cause a cascade effect, potentially collapsing all connected realities. My heart raced as I processed the implications. If I could destabilize the core, it might be enough to break the cabin's hold and allow me to escape. But the risk was enormous. If I failed, I could be trapped in a random reality forever. Or worse, cause the destruction of countless worlds. I took a deep breath, weighing my options. Stay here and be consumed by the cabin, or take a desperate gamble for freedom? The choice seemed impossible, but I knew I had to act. Stealing myself, I began to move towards the vortex. Each step was a struggle, as if I was walking through thick syrup. The room continued to shift and change around me, sometimes expanding to vast distances, other times shrinking until I felt claustrophobic. As I got closer to the core, I could feel its pull on me, both physical and mental. Memories and thoughts that weren't my own flashed through my mind, lives I had never lived, experiences I had never had. It was overwhelming, threatening to drown out my sense of self. No, I gritted out, forcing myself to focus on who I was, on my goal. I won't let you take me. No. I reached out towards the vortex, my hand trembling. The energy coursing through the air made my skin burn, but I pushed through the pain, just a little closer. Suddenly, a figure materialized in front of me, another version of myself, her eyes wide with panic. Don't, she cried. You don't know what you're doing. I hesitated for a moment, my hand inches from the swirling energy. I have to, I said, my voice cracking. It's the only way out. But at what cost, she pleaded. Think of all the lives you'll be affecting all the realities you might destroy. Her words hit me like a physical blow, making me pause. Was I really willing to risk everything, to potentially cause untold destruction, just for a chance at escape? But even as I wavered, I felt the cabin's hunger growing stronger. It was now or never. With a silent apology to all the versions of myself I might be dooming, I steeled my resolve. I'm sorry, I whispered, both to the other Sarah and to myself but I have to try. Before she could stop me, I plunged my hand into the vortex. The world exploded into blinding light and searing pain. I screamed as I felt reality fracture around me, the very fabric of existence tearing apart. The last thing I saw before everything went white was the other Sarah's face, a mixture of horror and understanding etched across her features. Then there was nothing but chaos and the sensation of falling through an endless void. I opened my eyes to find myself sprawled on the forest floor, pine needles poking into my skin. The air was crisp and cool, filled with the scent of evergreens. Sunlight filtered through the canopy above, dappling the ground with shifting patterns of light and shadow. For a moment, I just lay there, gasping for breath. My head throbbed, and every muscle in my body ached as if I'd run a marathon. Slowly, I pushed myself up to a sitting position, leaves in the twigs clinging to my clothes. Behind me, where the cabin had stood, there was nothing but a clearing. The ground was scorched and bare, as if a fire had raged through the area. Wisps of smoke still curled up from the blackened earth. It's gone, I whispered, my voice hoarse. I... I did it. Relief washed over me, so intense it made me dizzy. I'd escaped. The nightmare was over. I wanted to laugh, to cry, to shout my triumph to the sky. But as the initial euphoria faded, a creeping doubt began to set in. I looked around, taking in my surroundings more carefully. The forest seemed familiar, the same one I'd been hiking through when I first stumbled upon the cabin. But something felt... off. The colors seemed too vivid, the shadows too deep. 
When I focused on individual trees, their bark appeared to shift and swirl in impossible patterns, and the bird song echoing through the woods had an eerie, almost mechanical quality to it. No, I muttered, shaking my head. It can't be. I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the protest of my aching body. I had to get out of here, to find civilization. Maybe then I could confirm that this was really my world, that I'd truly escaped. As I started to hike away from the clearing, my steps faltering and uncertain, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every rustle in the underbrush, every snapping twig made me jump. The forest seemed to stretch on endlessly. No matter how far I walked, I couldn't find any sign of a trail or road. The sun remained fixed in the same position overhead, never moving despite what felt like hours passing. Panic began to build in my chest. What if I hadn't escaped at all? What if this was just another of the cabin's realities, a more elaborate illusion designed to torment me? I paused, leaning against a tree to catch my breath. As I did, I noticed something carved into the bark, a series of strange symbols that looked disturbingly similar to those I'd seen in the physicist's journal. My heart sank. This couldn't be a coincidence. Either I was still trapped in the cabin's web of realities, or my actions had irreparably altered my own world. Either way, the implications were terrifying. I sank to the ground, my back against the tree, and buried my face in my hands. The forest continued its eerie song around me, oblivious to my distress. I was free of the cabin, but at what cost? And could I ever truly be certain that I'd escaped?